turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be honing in on verses 14 to 17. And the theme is living by the Spirit includes adoption. Living by the Spirit includes adoption. If you're a visitor with us this morning, I normally don't dress this casually, but uh, this is part of my opening illustration. So I wore this t-shirt, got the jeans on. I'm doing the Josh look up here. We're, we're all good. But this idea of adoption being brought into the family, receiving the status of a child. A couple of weeks ago, my family, uh, immediate family, was able to go to Texas, and we were in uh, Fort Worth to participate in and be there for my brother, Nathan, my younger brother, Nathan, and his wife were adopting their first child. And so uh, we wanted to be a part of that, and we went to the courtroom and participated in that. And there's a picture right up there of us and my parents in the back, and then Nathan and Diana with their first adopted child. Lord willing, they'll be getting two more in January. Uh, but uh, JJ is now Jonathan Lloyd, and he's now Jonathan Lloyd Burgraff. And so that two-year-old curly-haired uh, bundle of energy is now part of our family. And it was great to participate in that. I, we overwhelmed the courtroom. There was over a hundred of us that jammed into that little courtroom to participate and celebrate with Nathan and Diana and, and welcome uh, young Jonathan into the family. And it was just a neat process to see adoption. What a, what a concept the, that a parent takes a child and brings them into their family. And that's what we want to hone in on today, because we are touched by adoption. We are adopted, every one of us, into the family of God. I mean, that's just such a beautiful metaphor and picture, but it's not just that. It's a reality of who we are in Jesus Christ. So living by the Spirit produces that within us. We've seen already in this study of Romans chapter 8 and verses 1 to 4 that because we are in the Spirit, we are no longer condemned. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ because we've been set free from the law of sin and death by the Spirit through the work of Jesus Christ. And last week we looked at the truth that not only are we no longer condemned, but we are changed by the Spirit to live according to Him rather than our flesh. Living by the Spirit as this chapter continues and as Paul unfolds the truths of this great chapter also includes adoption. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. That's our main idea this morning. Those of us led by the Spirit belong to God's family. We're a part of God's family. He begins by saying those led by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, indicates that our whole course of life is now determined by the Spirit. We are God's child, and as God's child, we are led by His Spirit. That means the decisions that we make, the choices that we come to, all of that, the whole course of our life, here on out, is under God's control, determined by God, or led by His Spirit. And as we are led by His Spirit, those of us that are, we are, and the phrase here is children of God. Actually, in this particular verse 14, it's the, the word for son. We are the sons of God. And we're going to unpack this truth. What does it mean to be the son of God? We're going to unpack that truth this week and next week because this same theme has implications that go beyond verses 14 to 17. We'll see this thought brought up in the passage next week, 18 and following, because not only do we see what we'll have today, but the idea of the Son of God being a Son of God has big words here, cosmological and eschatological implications. Cosmological meaning the world. It has, it has implications for this world system and what our relationship is to the world to come. But being a Son of God also has eschatology, eschatological implications, end time Implications: What we're going to be like in glory as the true sons of God. That all gets dealt with in next week's passage, so stay tuned for that. But this week we're going to hone in on 14 to 17 and what it means as a, being a part of God's family, what that means for us to be in the family of God. This is the, the familial relationship that we have with God. That's typically what we think of when we think of the idea of adoption. 
being a part of God's family. So what does this mean that we belong to God's family? I'm afraid that too many of us live our lives not recognizing all that we have in this relationship with God through the Spirit. I don't think we realize and use all that we have in this relationship. I think many of us are like, are like the adult, and I would like to think older adult, but I'm included in this now too, but the adult who gets that cell phone, that new smartphone for the first time. My mother-in-law, she is just will, re, will not get a cell phone, right? Like she has a flip phone. She's fine with that. She'll receive phone calls, but she doesn't want to text. She doesn't want all that other stuff. It's too confusing. Just keep that away. I'll just stay with this. Thank you very much. Now, if my mother-in-law would get a phone, she won't even touch my father-in-law's cell phone. She's like, I don't even want to touch it. Um, but if she were to get one of those, she would probably use the phone part of it and maybe read text messages that were sent to her. That would be it. But the power of a cell phone is this, that there's so much more you can do with it, right? You can almost do everything that most of us need as far as communication goes, emails and texting and go on the internet and do searching and all of that stuff with that device. But many of us, I think, are like her in that she wouldn't use that for all it's capable of. I like to think of myself as one who knows how to use the thing, but I was at Bush Gardens the other week, and I, I was acting all uh, up-to-date with the times. Instead of having the physical ticket for Bush Gardens, I had the, the ticket on my cell phone, right? You know, you get the scan code. So I'm, I'm there checking in, and I'm feeling all good about myself, and the lady's trying to scan my phone, and she's like, oh, you got it way too dark. Lighten it up. And then I, like, froze. I'm like, wait, how do I do that? You know, and I'm, I'm like, and she just took my phone and it's like, whoop, and then hands it back to me. I'm like, sheesh. I thought I was good with this thing. I'm terrible with it. Um, we, we fail so much in what is ours. The power that we have, the capabilities that we have. I don't like to think of it, but I'm like that progressive commercial, right? Don't become your parents. I'm becoming my parents more and more. But adoption, being a part of God's family. I think so many of us fail to realize all that we're capable of. All that's ours because of this relationship. Paul unpacks some of these truths in this text for us. Because this idea of being a member of God's family comes with certain rights, status, inheritance, privileges. We've moved from a one state over to another. So what does this mean for us? Number one, we receive the Spirit that adopts us into intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. This is verse 15. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God, and the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. We are adopted into an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. Paul begins his explanation here by speaking about what we no longer are, and he contrasts the implications then of what being a member of God's family means for us. We're no longer in the realm of the flesh, under the control of sin, ultimately having this determined outcome of death, helpless under law. We're no longer in that realm anymore under the control of those things, but we are in the realm of the Spirit. We are able to live righteously, and we now possess life, eternal life. And because of that, we no longer need to be controlled by a a mindset, an attitude, an outlook of fear. All of those other things, flesh, sin, death, law, produce in us a fear because we can't measure up to God's standard. And because we can't measure up, we fall short, and falling short of the glory of God leaves us in a very precarious position. Life in our previous realm under the control of sin and death and flesh, meant slavery. Slavery to sin. Slavery to death. And this is that metaphor of slavery, that picture of slavery, is one of 
not just service. That's not the right word. Michael Bird in his commentary uses the word servility. Because we think of service as, well, we're supposed to serve God, and we are. But servility is this idea that we are under, we are controlled by, and we aren't able to act in any way freely. You see, the first century slave, while there was, it's different than American slavery was, there was still an indenturedness, a, a coming under a number where despite some of the things you were able to do, there was always this reminder that you were in servility to another. And if you did not fulfill the responsibilities that you had to that other, that would mean punishment. It would mean condemnation. It would mean difficulty. It would mean not just trial, but suffering. And the Spirit, as He adopts us and brings us into the family of God, frees us from that spirit of slavery to fear. We no longer fear anymore. And it's one of the sad realities to see a believer today set free by the Holy Spirit, have life, eternal life in the Holy Spirit, still dominated by fear. We're no longer slaves to fear. We are what? The child of God. What a truth that is, because with that comes freedom. With that comes hope. Rather than those controlled by fear, we have the Spirit that we've received through this adoption to sonship, and by Him we can cry, Abba, Father. For those of us who are believers, we no longer fear judgment. Because there is no condemnation for those of us in Jesus Christ. Our eternal destination is set in Jesus Christ. We are seated with Him in the heavenly realms. We're already with Him in glory. Because we have received the spirit of sonship. We have received the spirit of adoption. We are the children of God. In the Greco-Roman world, that idea of adoption to sonship was a very powerful picture. Date myself a little bit. When I was a child, we used to watch Easter all the time. They had the movie Ben-Hur on, right? You remember that movie Ben-Hur? I know they remade it, but like the old one with Charlton Heston, right? That's still the classic. Um, but I remember watching that. You remember, if you remember that story at all, here's this, this uh, Jewish uh, individual who is from a pretty prominent family, but through a, a set of circumstances ends up in a Roman slave ship. All of his rights revoked. But he ends up saving the life of this important uh, Roman official. Uh, and, and, and this Roman official, to, to express his appreciation, adopts him into his family. And he gets all the rights and the privileges of what it means to be a son of this very important individual. You see, in the Greco-Roman world, adoption to sonship came with incredible rights, status, privileges, sometimes even above what might come to a naturally born child. The Caesars, for instance, would do this. Julius Caesar does this with Augustus, Octavius, where he adopts him as his son so that he would become essentially the next Caesar with all of the rights and privileges that belong to Julius. That's kind of the idea here as we hear this, I, this notion of sonship, adoption to sonship. All that the son would possess was given to this one who was adopted in. And this came about not by the will of the child. It came about solely by the choice of the father to adopt them in, to bring about this relationship. I was thinking about how to illustrate, you know, the kind of the rags to riches and, and the musical that ran through my mind, and somebody pointed out other better musicals, and it's right, like Les Mis and some of these other ones, but Annie is the one that ran into my mind. Don't, don't, let that allow, don't allow that to speak about my masculinity in any way, but Annie was the one that ran into my mind. You know, the hard knocks life for this little orphan child, right, who grows up in this system of, of abuse and neglect and, and difficulty. But then this in a sense, this stroke of luck where the, the, the richest man in Manhattan adopts her into his 
or brings her into his family, and she experiences all of these riches and all of these pleasures and all of this. But the real beauty of that story is the relationship that ultimately grows and is established. We'll see riches and we'll see benefits in a few minutes here, but Paul starts off speaking of this relationship that we have because we've been adopted into God's family. And it's one of intimacy. There's a lot that comes along with adoption that comes along with the fact that we now are the child of our Heavenly Father. He gives us provision. He provides for our needs. He gives us out of His riches so we never have to worry about what we need. God supplies our needs out of His riches. God provides us with security. Our eternal destiny is set in the hands of God, so we no longer have to fear death. We've been set free brought un from under that power, and we have a security in this relationship with our Heavenly Father. We have a knowledge of God. We don't have to wonder, do we know the true God? We are in relationship with the true God, and we gain an access to Him. We can go to Him and speak to Him. But the thing that Paul hones in on here, while all of those things are true, he really focuses our attention on this intimate relationship. We can cry out to him what? Abba, Father. The privilege of having an intimate relationship with the supreme being, the most powerful being in all the universe. We are able to cry out to our Heavenly Father who will hear and, and respond to us in a way that is in our best interest. Now that doesn't mean it's what we want all of the time. Just like any child, we will request of our Heavenly Father things that He knows aren't best for us. But this is the beauty of being in relationship with our Heavenly Father. He is the Father who truly knows best. And He will give to us what we need most. We have a relationship with Him. A closeness that belongs only to the child. And we have access then where we can come right into His presence. I grew up in a, a pastor's home. And one of the things, and I've, I think I've used this illustration before, but it works so well here. One of the things of growing up in a, in a having your dad as the pastor is, I had access all of the time to my dad's office. My office is over in those buildings, the building across, you know, the office buildings. Very few of you probably would just go wandering into my office, I'm, I'm guessing. You would have to come through Heather, and Heather would make sure that you don't just get access to me, right? Um, but growing up as a pastor's kid, I would just go walking into my dad's office. We'd go in there before church, and we'd go rooting through his drawers and get, you know, his certs or whatever candy was in there, and, you know, we, he has shoe polish in there, so we would want to polish our shoes in there, and we, we'd just do whatever we wanted in Dad's office, because we had access to that. You see, when you're a child, you have access to your father in a way, in an intimate way, that really no one else has. You and I have that with our Heavenly Father. We can go right into that most holiest of places. We saw this in our study of Hebrews. We can go right in there with confidence and speak to our Heavenly Father because we are His child, adopted into His family. So there is an intimacy there with the most powerful being in the universe. Adoption, being a part of God's family, means that we receive a spirit that brings us into an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. Secondly, we possess an assurance that we are God's children. Notice verse 16, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Spirit who removes fear by bringing us into God's family also gives us assurance. We saw this a couple of weeks ago in verses 1 to 4, that because of what Jesus Christ has done. We don't face condemnation. Death and sin have been defeated. They freed us from the powerlessness of what the law couldn't do so that we now meet the righteous requirement of the law. We walk by the Spirit and we're able to live. And this then assures us of a future in glory 
with our Heavenly Father. And the Spirit now brings that full assurance by testifying with our spirit. He bears witness, is the word. He, he speaks to us that we are the children of God, that you are God's child. You see, verses 1 and 4 of Romans establish what I would refer to as the objective reality of who we are in relationship with God. It's objective because Jesus Christ lived Jesus Christ died, Jesus Christ rose, and Jesus Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father. Those are historical truths, and based on that reality, that objective reality, we have a relationship with our Heavenly Father, so we have assurance because of that. If you place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ today, you as well can have that assurance. That's our objective assurance, but there's also a subjective assurance a subjective knowing, an inner testimony of the Spirit that if we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, yes, we objectively know that truth, but subjectively, and, and dare I say, a feeling that we get is that we are the child of God. In our minds and in our hearts, the Holy Spirit speaks to us, testifies, and bears witness that we are God's child children. Why do I say that's subjective? Because it's, it's hard to, to, to put a, a finger on that, right? Like, what is that supposed to feel like? But if you're a child of God, you know the feeling. Because the Spirit speaks. It's not an audible voice, but it's an inner sense. And here's how the Spirit does this speaking, does this testifying. He does it primarily through His Word. He takes the Word of God as we read it, or as we hear it, or as we preach it, and we hear it preached, he takes that word and he testifies through that word that we are his children, that we are God's children. He convicts us. He points things out to us. He takes that word and he speaks it afresh and applies it in our life. That's the inner working of the Holy Spirit, testifying that we are the children of God, that what we're hearing from God's word is true. But there's another side to this subjective witness. And that is when we are answering others. Luke chapter, I think it's Luke chapter 11, or Luke chapter 12, verses 11 to 12. Matthew and Mark also speak of this as well. But Jesus told his disciples that there will be times you will be brought before officials or you will be brought before the synagogue and, and questions will come. And I think the idea here is, is that there are times in our lives where we will be asked and put on the spot to speak about and to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in those moments when that testimony is asked of us, we sometimes won't even know how to respond, but the Spirit will speak. That's what Jesus says. It's not going to be you speaking. It's going to be the Holy Spirit speaking through you, giving you the words to say to defend the gospel. Now that doesn't mean don't ever read God's word. It'll just happen. That's probably not how it works, okay? There's a familiarity with the gospel. But that fear, that nervousness, that we won't know what to say, if we're depending on God, if we're in His Word, if we're walking with Jesus Christ, the Spirit will testify through us. And that again demonstrates that we are the children of God. A third way I think that sometimes the Spirit gives us this testimony is through that intuition, that inner direction. I think that happens at times in our lives, but this one's a bit trickier to identify as the work of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because sometimes that inner sense might not be the Holy Spirit. Sometimes that could be our own mind. It could be our own flesh at times. It might even be, as John warns in 1 John, test the spirits to see if they are of God. What am I getting at? Well, if the Spirit is working through our minds, He's always going to work in a way consistent with his word. The Spirit's never going to contradict the word of God. So sometimes as we rely on his direction, as we come to God and we pray and we expect God to direct, we can trust the fact that God will lead consistent with his word in our life through the work of the Holy Spirit as well. But it's never going to be something that's contrary to Scripture. Yet when we see that and experience it, 
it testifies again in our life that we are the children of God. Jesus gives us his spirit to provide that witness with our spirit that we are God's children. One of the questions that comes up in my mind when I think of this truth, this second truth, is why then do we doubt? Why do we doubt? If the spirit is in there testifying that I'm the child of God, why is it sometimes that I still doubt God? That I doubt God's love? That I question that? Or that I doubt my even relationship with God? Am I a child of God? Why do we doubt? I, I think there are a couple things that that indicates. One, for sure, is sin. If we're saying yes to sin, if we're saying yes to the flesh, we are not walking by the Spirit. We are not living by the Spirit. And therefore, that w inner witness can be, in a sense, silenced. I don't want to say, dare I say, quenched, right? We're not to quench the Spirit by saying yes to the flesh. Some of us rarely open God's Word and read God's Word. And I think we miss out then on that inner testimony that the Word of God does in our life to speak through that Word to testify that we are God's children. So sin or failure to be in God's Word can lead to this. As well as just paying attention to and then giving in and following other voices like our flesh. That just acting on feeling, acting on what I want to do, acting what's in my own interests out of flesh, again, silences and questions the work of the Spirit in our life, or quenches the work of the Spirit in our life, and moves us away from this inner assurance that we have that we are the children of God. If you're struggling with that today, this is why God has brought you into his family, not to live in isolation from one another, but to be connected with one another so that your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ can come alongside you and encourage you, speak God's word into your life, hold you accountable, see your life, examine your life, point out ways in which you're walking and wandering away from God so that together we walk in closeness and in unity by the Spirit bearing witness within all of us that we are the children of God. That assurance is yours. That assurance is mine because of this relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father through the Spirit. What does this mean? It means we have this intimate relationship. It means that we have this assurance. And lastly, it means that we inherit all that belongs to Christ. Verse 17. Now if we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. One of the perks of being in the family of the most powerful and gloriously rich being in the universe is that we stand to inherit a boatload of things. More than we can possibly fathom or imagine. Now I know the Bible speaks of what we will inherit and some of the stuff that we will get when we get to glory. But I think it only gives us a glimpse of all that is ours as we stand to inherit unbelievable, unfathomable riches from God. And those things aren't simply financial. Financial stuff depreciates, right? I mean, if you've watched your bank account right now, you can see that the value of what you have in there is going down almost by the day with inflation, right? What we stand to inherit someday isn't susceptible to inflation or depreciation. It doesn't go down in value because it's God's riches. We are heirs to all that God has in store for us. We are heirs of God's. We are His child and His riches will be bestowed on us. Why do we get to be heirs of all that God has? Because the Spirit has adopted us into His family so that we are God's heirs. We receive all of that with Messiah, with Jesus Christ. He is our spiritual Savior, but He's also our spiritual sibling. And we see all then of the, the New Testament family language really coming to a, a climax in this passage where the New Testament speaks of us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the siblings of Jesus Christ and the children of God, and we stand to inherit all that is God's and all that is our brother Jesus Christ's. As God's children, we come under His care 
We come under his protection. Why? Because we are heirs of his. You know, one of the amazing things out of that adoption ceremony that I witnessed with my, my brother and his wife is the, the, the judge never talked to the child. The child was a two-year-old, right? J, JJ couldn't understand really anything that was going on there. He was just smiles and giggles and, you know, all of that all that morning. But as the judge talks, he talked to, or she talked to um, my brother Nathan and his wife Diana and had questions for them. Because all of the responsibility of adoption and the care and the provision and the security and the responsibility falls on whom? The parent. It's the parent's responsibility. The child simply benefits and that's a beautiful picture of who we are as a member of God's family. We don't do anything to merit the relationship or bring about the relationship. Our Heavenly Father brings us into His family. Now we respond by faith in Jesus Christ, but when we do that, we become heirs of all that God has for those who are His children. This enables then our adoption so we get all the rights and privileges, not only as a child of God, but all that belong to whom? Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate Son of God, but we are a child of God because we are in Jesus Christ and we receive all that was Christ's. We will receive all that is Christ's. I mean, this just sounds unbelievably awesome to us. We just get this huge benefit, right? There must be a catch. This has to be too good to be true. It's not too good to be true, but there is a catch. And it's that last clause of verse 17. We are heirs of God's. We are co-heirs with Christ if we are God's children. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The catch is that we have to suffer with in order to be glorified with and to be heir with Christ. In the original language, uh, the, the word for co-heir with Christ and then the word for suffering with and glorified with all have this preposition with attached to them. We are heir with Christ. We suffer with and then are glorified with. It connects all of them together. And it defines what it means to be a child of God. To be the spiritual sibling with Jesus and a member of God's family means that we will reflect Jesus Christ on earth. God is glorified through Jesus Christ. As his gospel, this is our second conviction, is, is what? Preached, is spoken, is declared, is believed and is obeyed. And that transforms us to look like and mirror Jesus Christ. We reflect Jesus Christ on earth. We're his followers. Which means that we follow where he went and do what he did if we are to receive the glory that he received. In order to inherit the future glory, we have to be willing in this life to surrender all of our life over to our Father to use our lives as he sees fit. That's what Jesus did. And this is what is required of his brothers and sisters. We don't like that part of this, right? That's the part. I want, I want the inheritance stuff. I like the intimate relationship talk. I like the idea that the Spirit gives me assurance. But if we are going to follow Jesus Christ, we're going to walk the path of Jesus Christ. That path leads through suffering in order to reach glory. Most likely, God, our Heavenly Father, will allow us to suffer. So what does this mean for us today? This is really difficult for us that are Americans because as an American, we have rights. And we're privileged. And we like our rights. And I'm, I'm proud to be an American, right? As I heard a pastor say this last week, preaching, the, not this text, but another one. Not, somebody should write a song about that. I'm proud to be an American. 
But we like that, and we resonate with that, and that's a powerful picture to us, and, and, and no doubt we have rights. But above being an American, we are a member of the family of God, and there's also rights and privileges that come with that. And here's the difficulty. The rights and privileges that God says we have in relationship to him as his children sometimes come in contradiction with the rights that we have as Americans. How so? We'll take your Bibles real quick and look back to Luke chapter 6. And like I said, I was at a pastor's conference this week and he was preaching this passage as our, our rights. And I'm not going to give the eight bill of rights that he came up with out of this passage, but I think you'll get the idea as I just rehearse this. But Jesus, speaking to his followers, this is Luke's Sermon on the Plain. It's similar to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. And he says this, But to you who are listening, speaking to his followers, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. You, you have the, the right to love your enemies. You have the right to do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. You have... The right to pray for those who do not treat you well. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other one also. You have the right to be abused. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. You have the right to be taken advantage of and stolen from. Give to everyone who asks you, and everyone, if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them as well. If you have your property confiscated, you have the right to give them even more. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Verse 35, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. You have the right to to do all of these things and to be mistreated without any expectation of having it rectified then your reward will be great. And notice this next phrase, and you will be what? Children of the Most High. Because he, the Most High, is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. If you're in God's family, you have rights that supersede your rights as an American. And you have the rights to be taken advantage of for the cause of Jesus Christ. Because our Heavenly Father loves and gave His Son for the wicked and for the unmerciful. So if we're going to reflect Jesus Christ, it's not standing up for our rights as Americans. It's displaying the rights of the children of God. And at times, that's going to mean suffering. But when, it's, when we suffer, it brings glorification. Why? Because God's power is seen in weakness. And God's power is seen in our feebleness. And God's power isn't seen in our retaliation. God's power is seen when we are brought low. That's the challenge of what it means to be a member of the family of God. Are you willing to testify of your relationship, the power of God, the glory of God, even in your weakness. Does your life indicate that you are a member of God's family? Do your neighbors know that? Not because you stand for certain rights, but because you display the rights as a child of God. We're going to close with another song. Jason's going to come up and do one in a minute, but as we close down, I'm speaking about adoption from the perspective of my brother doing this. But Kyle's going to come up and he's going to just close us with a testimony of what adoption has meant for his family and some of the implications that they've learned firsthand in the process of adoption.